Ooh, we have a box around here. All right, so here, <laughs> it's a little off center, but that's all right. Um, our video for the first part of Asses and Bases. I have no idea how many parts this guy's going to end up being, but just go with me. This is the one where I'll address all of the Bronsted Lowry information, how to identify conjugate acids, conjugate bases, and all that stuff. So, our discussion of acids and bases begins with water. This is the solvent that makes acids and bases possible. And I know that I told you guys when we were writing net ionic equations that you always write water as H2O because water doesn't ionize. Well, it kind of sort of does, just not that much. Uh, one out of every hundred trillion water molecules will actually separate into the hydro hydrogen and hydroxide ions. And if you count up these zeros, you'll see that there are 14 of them. This number, when we're talking about acids and bases, a little light bulb should go off on your head. The pH scale ranges from 0 to, hey, magic number 14. Um, and the reason that it ranges from 0 to 14 is because the pH scale is based on hydrogen ion concentration in a solution, which is dependent on how much water ionizes. Uh, this statement right here, not the best statement, not the best way to phrase this thing, but adding acids or bases will increase the number of ions in solution of water. It won't necessarily increase the actual, it won't necessarily increase uh, this process right here. It'll just increase the number of ions depending if it is acid or base. Um, so there's a couple of definitions with acids and bases that we have to deal with. Um, we'll focus on one of them in class here, the Bronsted-Lowry definition, but I do want to let you know about the other uh, definitions in case you hear them and you're like, oh, I never learned about that one. Well, yeah, you kind of did. Um, before we get into that, just a little refresher from last chapter of strong versus weak. Last chapter we talked about strong versus weak electrolytes. And that's dependent entirely on how much a compound will ionize. And with strong versus weak acid and bases, it's the exact same thing. If you have a strong acid or a strong base, it's going to ionize completely. You'll have this arrow that points only to products because any, with this particular case is sulfuric acid, any little molecule of sulfuric acid, the second it hits water, is going to ionize into um, a hydrogen ion and actually a hydrogen sulfate ion. The two hydrogens don't come off at the same time, but I'll explain that on uh, the next slide. But it is going to completely ionize. You know what? I'm actually going to fix this. So sorry if you already wrote this down. Um, it's actually going to ionize into a hydrogen ion and a hydrogen sulfate ion. This is the reaction that will take place completely. Uh, weak acids and bases, they only ionize partly, and they have this, the same equilibrium thing like what we talked about in uh, Chapter 13 with Le Chatelier's. And so this particular one, again, I'm going to fix this because this really isn't the best way to write this. It's the first hydrogen ion comes off, and then you have hydrogen phosphor. Oh, that two, that's a two, sorry. Um, and so this is a reversible reaction in that when you put hydrogen uh, phosphate into um, water, it's not going to completely ionize. Some of it's going to stay together and some of it will ionize. Um, and so this will be a weak acid. This would be a strong acid. There are actually seven strong acids and eight strong bases. If you take AP, you'll need to memorize those, but in this class, it's not that big of a deal. Um, <coughs> This acid in particular is important because uh, it's used in battery acid. And this acid is a particular favorite of mine because it is the main acid in uh, dark sodas. Kind of not the healthiest acid to be consuming because it'll wreak havoc on your kidneys. Ladies, it'll suck calcium from your bones and do all kinds of other god awful things, but lord does it taste good. All right, so I kind of mentioned back here that, you know, this ionization doesn't actually occur like this. It's not both hydrogens that pop off, and this ionization doesn't occur where all three hydrogens pop off. It's actually a rule with how many hydrogens does an acid have? A monoprotic, protic uh, refers to proton, 
And if you think about it, a hydrogen ion is just a proton. If you were to draw um, a Bohr diagram of hydrogen, you know, you'd have typical hydrogen. You would draw your nucleus, and the only thing that's in the nucleus of a hydrogen atom is the one proton. And then circling around the hydrogen atom, or uh, nucleus, is its one little electron. Well, if you have a hydrogen positive ion, a hydrogen cation, the only way you can do that, you can't lose protons, because then that changes the element. <laughs> you lost this proton, and you have nothing. You know, little electrons zipping around. Um, but the only way you can become positive is by losing electrons. And if you notice, the only thing left is our little proton. So a hydrogen ion is a proton. They're the same thing. And because a hydrogen ion can't exist, you know, just like floating around in the air, this is only going to exist in solution, solution being in water. Well, if you add the two of these up, you get the hydronium ion. And so you can, these two things can pretty much be used interchangeably. They're the same thing. Since this guy can only exist in a water solution, you put him plus the water together and you get the hydronium ion. So I'll kind of sometimes get lazy and just write the H pluses because it's shorter and easier to write. And sometimes to prove a point, I'll go ahead and put the H3O plus in there. But they do mean the exact same thing. So anyways, a monoprotic acid has only one proton to give. <clears throat> um, and so monoprotic acids would be acids with only one hydrogen, like hydrochloric acid or um, perchloric acid. Great little acid here. Um, diprotic acids have two protons, so your H2SO4, sulfuric acid, or sulfurous acid, those are both diprotics. And then triprotics, phosphoric acid being the best one, uh, have three hydrogens, uh, protons, to give away. And it doesn't give them away all at once. If <coughs> You think of the protons like baseballs, and you think of the acid like a pitcher. A pitcher can only throw one ball at a time. It can't throw all three balls at the same time. It's just not right and doesn't follow rules, and you know it can only throw one ball at a time. So that's what's going on here. You have sulfuric acid, and sulfuric acid will get rid of its first hydrogen completely. That's why it's a unidirectional arrow. Then you have this thing hydrogen sulfate ion with the negative charge. Well now that hydrogen sulfate ion can get rid of this proton and this should actually be a double arrow because this is an equilibrium thing um, to form the second hydrogen ion and the sulfate ion. Now the reason that this one's equilibrium, this guy already has a negative charge. So how likely do you think he's going to be to get rid of another positive ion and become even more negative. It's not very likely at all. Uh, and so that's why this is reversible and not all of these HSO4 minuses go to the products. All of the H2SO4s will go here, but not all of the HSO4 minuses will go this way. Um, this is an equilibrium step, this is an all the way step. So it's just the first hydrogen in H2SO4 that is a strong acid hydrogen. <clears throat> um, same thing with H3PO4. It gives away the, the hydrogens in steps. So you have H3PO4 and phosphoric acid is a weak acid, so all of the, the arrows are bidirectional. So you'd have H2PO4 minus plus H plus. Then this guy, H2PO4 minus, even fewer of these guys will give away another hydrogen to form HPO42 minus. Now this guy still got one more hydrogen to give away, so HPO42 minus. Even less of these guys are gonna go through this reaction to give away that third uh, hydrogen. Basically with each step, it gets increasingly hard to remove that proton because the starting molecule is already negative, and so it tends to hold on to what little positivity it has left. So the first definition that we're going to talk about is the Arrhenius definition. This is the oldest definition of acids and bases. Um, basically, all it says is that acids will increase the hydrogen ion concentration in a solution. Uh, 
here's an example of nitric acid ionizing into the nitrate ion and the hydrogen ion. And bases will increase the hydroxide ion concentration of the solution. You can see here sodium hydroxide uh, separating into the hydroxide ion. Basically, this definition says that acids start with an H, bases end with an OH. It's not a great definition because it leaves a lot of things out. Um, and on that note, I've got to call this one quits, and we'll start part two.